910 Ministries podcast, No Trash, Just Truth, with hosts Chris Paxson and Rose Spiller. At Proverbs 910 Ministries, we are dedicated to taking out the trash of false teaching and replacing it with biblical truth. Welcome back. Today, we're starting a new series called Dysfunctional Children, Functional God. Now, you might be saying to yourself that you've never heard God referred to as functional. But functional means purposeful, and God has a purpose for the things that he does. He certainly does. And this parable we're going to be teaching on comes from Luke 15 and is commonly known as the parable of the prodigal son. A title which we think you'll see by the end of the series doesn't really fit this parable at all, at least not when it's understood correctly. Right. So before we get started, it's probably a good idea to talk about what the parables were for and why Jesus often taught the crowds using parables. To do that, let's go to Matthew 13, 10 to 17, which says, Then the disciples came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered them, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For to the one who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. This is why I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, you will indeed hear, but never understand, and you will indeed see, but never perceive. This people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears, they can barely hear, and their eyes have closed lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes for they see and your ears for they hear. For truly, I say to you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see and did not see it and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. In Matthew thirteen thirty four to 35 tells us, all these things Jesus said to the crowds in parables. Indeed, he said nothing to them without a parable. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter what has been hidden since the foundation of the world. And that prophecy is found in Psalm 78 too. So we see that the parables were for teaching truths about the kingdom to believers, but the parables both reveal and obscure truth. Unbelievers will be blinded to those truths as verse 11 and what we just read said. They will hear the words of the parable, but won't understand them. As an example... I just heard a popular Hillsong pastor say that we, meaning people, all people, are the pearls of greatest price and that Jesus gave all he had to buy us back from Satan because we mean so very much and are worth so much to God. Ugh. Well, all right, Jesus gave all he had. Isn't that everything? <laughs> that would be everything Ugh. in the entire universe. Oh my gosh, not only is that totally wrong, it's totally heretical, and it is a gross misunderstanding of a parable. With the help of the Holy Spirit, believers can understand the parables as we read them in scripture. Jesus explained the parables to his disciples when they didn't understand them, but he didn't explain them to the whole crowds. That's why you'll sometimes hear commentators call the parables divisive a word that most people wouldn't associate with Jesus, but he's often making distinctions between saved and unsaved sheep and goats. Exactly. A few other things about the parables are that although some are allegory, where each thing in the parable stands for something else, like the way Jesus explains the parable of the sower, not all the parables are allegory. And We should note that usually there's one significant theme in a parable, and in some of them, there may be more than one point, but we shouldn't try to make a significant theological point out of every single detail. For instance, the parable we know as the prodigal son has been called by liberal scholars the gospel, but it's in no way a summation of the gospel message. No, it's definitely not. There's no mention of the need for atonement for sin or the need for a messiah or mediator between us and God. It's really not the gospel. No. Something else we should keep in mind when we talk about the parables, as well as all scripture, is that they have to be looked at in context. And Chris, we talk about this all the time. Contextualization. What's surrounding them means something. To pull anything out of scripture, even a parable alone, without looking at the surrounding text, can make you miss the point altogether. 
Oh, absolutely. We talk about it ad nauseum. (laughs) And as we delve into this parable, it's best to start with taking a look at the text surrounding it. In the case of this one, we're going to start at the beginning of Luke 15. Jesus told three parables about lost things. So let's start by reading Luke 15, 1 to 2. I'll read it. It says, now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. Jesus was followed by lots of crowds during his ministry. And in the crowds were a mix of the Pharisees and the religious leaders of the time who were watching everything that was going on. And then there are those that are referred to here as tax collectors and sinners. Here's how the ESV study Bible defines sinners here. Pharisees would have regarded as sinners anyone who failed to keep God's law as they interpreted it. And the term here seems to reflect a commonly understood meaning by which it included both people guilty of publicly known sin and others who did not keep the strict purity requirements of the Pharisees. Yeah, and the tax collectors here were thought to be some of the worst of sinners not only because they were collecting taxes from the Jewish people for the Roman government, but because they were known to collect more than what was required because they pocketed the rest. And the Pharisees and scribes thought of themselves better than everybody else. They didn't see themselves as being sinners because they were so strict at trying to follow the law. And the rest of the people somewhat thought of them the same way. They thought the Pharisees had it all together when it came to following God. And then Jesus comes on the scene and he's associating with these quote unquote sinners. Yeah, and he's pretty popular with them. The Pharisees are already judging Jesus for receiving and eating with those considered sinners. Eating with someone implied that they were part of your circle, or at least they could be. You know the popular saying about the company you keep. Well, Jesus in the eyes of the Pharisees is keeping company with a bad crowd something that they deemed would make you unclean, and they're grumbling and murmuring, as some versions say, about it. So Jesus, knowing what they're saying and what they're thinking, answers their question that goes along with the statement, why is he hanging out with these sinners using parables? So Chris, let's read the first one about a lost sheep. Okay. Luke 15, three to seven says, so he told them this parable. What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors saying to them, rejoice with me for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, There will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Now, we know that Jesus came for the lost sheep of Israel, according to Matthew 15, 24. We also know that Jesus came to seek and save the lost, according to Luke 19, 10. And we know from John 10, 11, that Jesus is the good shepherd. And here he's talking about a shepherd leaving the larger group of sheep to go after one sheep that's lost. Why leave the 99 to go look for one who wandered off? Because Jesus didn't just come to save the lost. He came to seek and save his lost sheep. The lost on their own are dead in their trespasses and sins. They have no inclination to seek after God because they don't even know they need him. God has to turn our dead hearts from stone to flesh through the work of the Holy Spirit before we have any idea that we need saved. The shepherd doesn't herd the lost sheep back home using his staff and rod once he finds it. He puts the sheep on his shoulders and carries it home. The shepherd does all of the work getting the lost sheep home. All of the work. Because the sheep couldn't have done it. It was as good as dead in the state it was in off by itself. It needed the shepherd to do everything. Absolutely. And next we get a glimpse at the real heart of these parables of lost things the shepherd's reaction to finding his lost sheep. It's rejoicing. In contrast to the Pharisees grumbling and murmuring about eating with sinners who they would never associate with, the good shepherd not only seeks the lost, but rejoices when they're found. God cares for the lost. In John chapter 10, Jesus contrasts himself as the good shepherd with the hired hands 
who don't care for the sheep and run away as soon as danger comes. God sent prophets who were sometimes treated pretty badly. If you read through the prophetic books. Oh yeah. They were sent to a mostly unrepentant Israel over and over throughout the old Testament, calling them to repent. Those prophets were good shepherds of the people. Despite danger and suffering, they took God's warning to the people. They were the good shepherds pointing to the ultimate good shepherd, Jesus. Absolutely. But that wasn't the attitude of the religious leaders Jesus is addressing in the parable. In fact, it was pretty much judgment of others and a disregard for the welfare of others that most of them were about. The Pharisees and scribes are evil and they don't even know it. They think they're quote unquote good, but they're not. In their self-righteousness, they're judging everybody. Chris, including Jesus. <laughs> including Jesus. <laughs> I don't know. You know, it's crazy. But the tax collectors and sinners know they're not good. Many of them have probably lived with that label their whole lives. They had to be thinking, here is this man who we've seen teaching in the temple and with authority and we've heard about, and he's spending time with us and including us. I mean, that's such a contrast to the religiosity that they were used to. Yeah, absolutely. And I think religiosity and self-righteousness is what turns a lot of non-Christians off to Christianity today. And turns them off to even some Christians. When the gospel message is understood correctly, the person who's saved understands that they're sinners who brought absolutely nothing to the table for their forgiveness. They bought their own sin. That was it. They shouldn't be judging anybody and they shouldn't be judging non-believers. Absolutely. They should know better because they were once in that state of unforgiveness. And in addition, they still sin. The only difference is that God has had mercy on them, which should make them merciful to others. And, you know, sometimes it's hard to get an unbeliever to understand that that is truly what Christianity is, especially if they've been judged or are being judged by other Christians who don't really get that. That's right. That's why our words matter. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to quote from Monagerism here. Here's the quote. We should first observe in these verses the striking testimony which was borne to our Lord by his enemies. We read that when all the publicans and sinners drew near to him, the scribes and the Pharisees murmured, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. These words were evidently spoken with surprise and scorn and not with pleasure and admiration. These ignorant guides of the Jews could not understand a religious preacher having anything to do with wicked people. Yet their words worked for good. The very saying, which was meant for a reproach, was adopted by the Lord Jesus as a description of his ministry. It led to his speaking three of the most instructive parables which ever fell from his lips. The testimony of the scribes and Pharisees was strictly and literally true. The Lord Jesus is indeed one who receives sinners. He receives them to pardon them, to sanctify them, and to make them fit for heaven. It is his special office to do so. For this end, he came into the world. He came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. He came into the world to save sinners. What he was upon the earth, he is now at the right hand of God, and he will be for all eternity. He is emphatically the sinner's friend, end quote. I love that. And, you know, this parable ends with more rejoicing. The shepherd calls his friends and his neighbors to rejoice. And the last line says, just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. And Chris, this verse isn't saying that there is any person alive or ever have lived that doesn't need to repent. We know that since the fall, all people are dead in their sins. And as Romans 3.10 says, none is righteous, no, not one. So there's nobody ever lived other than Jesus who didn't need to repent. But what Jesus is addressing is the attitude of the self-righteous religious leaders. They're basing their salvation on their works, and they think they're saved without needing repentance because they think they're doing pretty good at keeping the law. Yeah. You know any Christians who are self-righteous, who rely on their good works for salvation, who are prim and proper on the outside and look down at others who openly sin? You know, I'm thinking of 
groups like Westboro Baptist Church, the ones who marched at funerals of service members holding up signs saying that it was judgment on the United States because of homosexuality in our country, self-righteous. Uh, there are people who believe that COVID was God's judgment and that only non-believers got it. And of course, we all know that's not true because you had it. That's right. So we know that's not true. Yeah. I mean, it's just self-righteousness. It, it is definitely self-righteous. And we're going to talk a lot about that in the next couple of weeks. That's the same type of people Jesus is addressing. People who think they're righteous and don't need to repent. But they should see that the rejoicing in this passage isn't over them. It's over the lost one who's saved. So, Chris, how about we go on to the next parable? Okay. This is the parable of the lost coin. Luke 15, 8 to 10. And it says, or what woman who has 10 silver coins and loses one of them does not light a lamp, sweep her house, and search carefully until she finds it. And when she finds it, she calls together her friends and neighbors to say, rejoice with me, for I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of God's angels over one sinner who repents. And again, we see the three themes emerging, lostness, repentance, and rejoicing. Yep. So what's a little different in this second parable? Well, there's some emphasis on carefulness and diligence that the woman uses to find the lost coin. She lights a lamp and sweeps, searching carefully, as the text says. This coin was obviously very important to her. Many commentators believe these 10 coins may have been her dowry. And without them, she probably wouldn't have been able to get married anytime soon. You know, but the lost sinners were not of importance to the Pharisees. In fact, the religious leaders of the day were very much like the prophet Jonah, who didn't want to see God's mercy on the Ninevites, and in fact was angry about it. In his eyes, they were sinners not deserving God's mercy, and he was angry. That seems right. crazy, but he was angry. That's right. Well, because he had a self-righteousness problem. The religious leaders were very much like Jonah in their hard attitudes, and like him, they don't see that they're wretched sinners too. I mean, God had to give Jonah an object lesson to teach him. Yep. But Luke eleven thirty seven 37 to 44 tells a different story. It says, while Jesus was speaking, a Pharisee asked to dine with him. So he went in and reclined at the table. The Pharisee was astonished to see that he did not first wash before dinner. And the Lord said to him, now you Pharisees cleanse the outside of the cup and not the dish, but inside you're full of greed and wickedness. You fools, did not he who made the outside make the inside also? But give his alms those things that are within, and behold, everything is clean for you. But woe to you, Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and every herb and neglect justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done without neglecting the other. Woe to you, Pharisees, for you love the best seat in the synagogue and greetings in the marketplace. Woe to you, for you're like unmarked graves and people walk over them without knowing it. Think that Pharisee was regretting inviting him to dinner? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, that's quite a rebuking, you know? That's, I mean, really, yes, it, it is. is. But that was their heart. Yes. But God's heart towards sinners is very different than Jonah's or the hearts of the religious leaders of Jesus' day and even sometimes our own. God isn't waiting around for people to clean themselves up so that they can come to him. In fact, we never can clean ourselves up enough. We couldn't. Jesus, the good shepherd, comes to us first. And once he's done that, then he begins the work of cleaning us up through the conviction and help of the Holy Spirit as we study scripture. Right. And he's given us the immense privilege of sharing his gospel message with people, sinners just like we are, so that they can come and receive his grace and mercy too. And the reason we're defining and talking about the groups watching Jesus before we delve into the parable known as the prodigal son is because Jesus inserts both groups into that parable. So do we see ourselves in either of these groups? Do we have a holier than thou attitude? Do we realize that we are sinners and that only by the grace and mercy of God that we are saved? When we talk to the unbelievers in our lives, what's our focus? Is it on the things we don't like about them? Do we mention their sin? Or even if unspoken, are we showing our distaste by our body language or facial expressions for something sinful about them or something we don't approve of them? Or 
Do we overlook all that, knowing that they can't even begin to quote unquote clean themselves up because they aren't saved and they don't have the Holy Spirit living in them? Exactly. And th- we should treat uh, unbelievers different than we treat other Christians. Yes. Christians are to judge the behavior of other Christians in their sphere and take them to biblical truth when they're sinning. Christians who ask for biblical answers about whether something is sinful or not, uh, when they ask for it, whether it's on social media or in person or whatever, Christians should be given that biblical answer, but they should be treated different than non-believers. That's right. Because the only biblical answer non-Christians or unbelievers need first is the gospel message. That involves telling them that they, like us, are sinners. And I think that's important. We want to make sure we point out that we're all sinners. We don't want to say you're a sinner in need of God. Exactly. And that should look very different than just pointing out their sins in a judgmental way. They need to hear that all of humanity is in a fallen, sinful state and that God is perfectly holy. He can't tolerate the sin of any man, but he's made a way, and that way is Jesus. So share the gospel with non-believers, not judgment. And that's all we have time for today. Tune in next week as we continue in the parable of lost things and dig into the par- what's commonly known as the parable of the prodigal son. Don't forget to check us out on Proverbs910Ministries.com, as well as all our other social media. If you sign up for our publisher, Ambassador International's Christmas in July event, Chris and I are actually live today, maybe already have been on since you're listening, but you can go back and see all our posts and videos. And you get to see our book cover reveal. That's right. Very, very exciting. The launch date is August 17th. Have a blessed day, everyone.